Hi, I'm Roz. In 2012, my son Ashton broke the world record in the decathlon. Then he went on to win the Olympic gold medal. Yeah. <laughs> the question from interviewers, print, radio, social media, and parents alike has been, how did you raise an Olympian? Well, get out your notebooks, folks, because today, I'm going to show you how to do just that. The first thing an Olympian needs is the perfect family heritage. <laughs> and now, the truth is, before today, I haven't found the courage to share this story. You see, long before I was ever the mother of an Olympian, I was just a little girl who got caught up in the wake of a brutal divorce that landed me on the doorstep of my grandma, Irene. From South Carolina, grandma had seven children. She cared for my terminally ill grandpa, Woodrow, and on any given day had a passel of grandkids running around her home where there wasn't much talking, there was a lot of yelling. She sowed and reaped a garden from which she fed all of us and would invite anyone into her home that needed a friend or a meal. It was a crazy house. And on top of all of that, she worked two factory jobs. Well, I stayed at grandma's while my parents got their lives together from kindergarten through fourth grade. I walked myself to and from school, arriving back home at grandma's where the television was my babysitter. And in the midst of what my grandma would have called Southern hospitality, to a little girl who was confused and felt abandoned, this all boiled down to nothing less than chaos. So to escape my reality, I would count in my head from one to a hundred. One to a hundred over and over again. I was 10 years old the year my grandma died. I moved on top of a mountain with my dad and stepmom. And if I was swallowed up by chaos as a little girl, now I was isolated by geography. The fact is, I was home alone a lot. So I grew to be an isolated, confused, scared girl who lived in a world where nothing seemed possible. Hey everyone, I'm Ashton. And I'm the Olympian. <laughs> but before that, I was just a little boy. And I thought life was great. I had an amazing childhood where I got to experience a lot of my interests. I had an awesome mom who helped me find my dream. And I grew up in Central Oregon, which was a world to me where anything was possible. I actually spent my younger years in a small town called The Pine, and I had a lot of great experiences there. Yeah, I had a lot of great experiences there. A funny story is how I made one of my first friends. It was in elementary school, and I was standing on the playground, just like I am now. This boy walks up to me. I have no idea who he is but he very nonchalantly goes, do you want to race? <laughs> Not doing anything better, so I say, sure. So he goes, all right, if I win, you have to be my friend. But if you win, we don't have to be friends. And I said, look, pal, you are asking the wrong guy. You're not going to have any friends after this. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. I thought it was a funny agreement, but... <laughs> so anyways, we take off across the playground, and I completely dust him. But regardless, we were friends ever since. So this was the deal. In my mind, friends were easy to come by, and so was fun. But it didn't stop there. I loved movement, running, jumping, throwing, kicking, flipping, riding, climbing. I liked all that stuff. Sports was a great way to experience that. One of the first sports I did was baseball. Okay, baseball, the American sport. 
I wanted Ashton to have experiences in his childhood that I didn't have. I signed him up for Little League. Ashton was going to be a t-baller. <laughs> it was our first adventure together. We collected the list of required items from the coach and made our way to the nearest athletic store. Well, we shuffled down the aisle, Ashton and I, collecting every item on the list. Bat, check. Mitt, check. Baseball tee, check. Uniform, check. Required protective gear. <laughs> Jock strap. What? <laughs> right? Well, we went down the aisle further until, well, we found the boxes that said jock strap. I took the thin piece of material out of the box, held it up to the light, and I thought two things. Okay, how is this supposed to protect anything? And two, how do you figure out what size to get? Well, just then, a voice came over the loudspeaker. Mom on aisle five. Mom on aisle five. That was me. Just then, a gentleman comes from around the corner looking sheepish, and well, he helped Ashton and I figure out our protective gear problem. And while we crossed the parking lot, Ashton clutching his new treasures to his chest. In the back of my mind, I'm thinking, okay, I've got to figure this out because I have just spent all the bill money on mitts, bats, and jock straps. So item number three, when raising an Olympian, you have to know your gear. <laughs> and you have to have a creative sense when paying bills. <laughs> so over here, my mom was struggling with inexperience and being a single parent. And I think it just started there, because after baseball, my interest only grew. I wanted to be a Ninja Turtle. I saw, yeah, I saw them on Saturday morning cartoons, and I would try to do all their karate moves. So mom signed me up for martial arts. I wanted to be a fighter pilot, because I saw Top Gun, and I thought Goose and Maverick were awesome. So mom signed me up for the Young Eagles Club of Central Oregon, where I got to sit co-pilot in a plane. And believe it or not, I actually wanted to be an Olympian. I saw Michael Johnson run around the track on TV in his golden spikes. So I went out in the yard and ran around in the dirt. And mom, she bought me a track suit and track spikes that I actually wore in PE class until I was old enough to join the track team. <laughs> <laughs> I also liked drawing. Occasionally, I would draw cartoons. And this one day, my mom came up to me when I was drawing cartoons, and she says, you know, Ash, there are people who make their whole lives about drawing cartoons. You can too if you want. It's called a cartoonist. And I was like, hmm, didn't know that. Doesn't really sound like the best job in the world, though. But she looked at me and she said, Ashton, if you love it, it doesn't matter. You can be a cartoonist and I'll be proud of you, as long as you're the best damn cartoonist you can possibly be. <laughs> so, look, I didn't know what Ashton was going to pursue, but I knew that whatever it was, I didn't want to hold him back because of my own limitations and lack of knowledge about so many things. And I felt shame that Ashton didn't have a dad. The truth is, as Ashton became more Ashton, I knew that I wasn't going to be enough. Let him know what the fourth thing is. Ashton. <laughs> so the fourth thing that you must have when you're raising an Olympian is an Olympic quality father figure, of course. <laughs> so this was the worst experiment ever, guys. Big fat fail, okay? Think in terms of that TV reality show, The Bachelor. Yeah, except for a little bit different. Okay, Bachelor number one. Well, think of the movie title, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, right? Because he liked to take them a lot when he would disappear, a lot. And bachelor number two, well, he was like Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. I mean, his personality, bam, in a second. And bachelor number three, well, you know, he was more of an adventurer, like Indiana Jones. He liked to collect artifacts. Artifacts that technically weren't his to collect. <laughs> And if my grandma was here, she would have said, Rosie, girl, baby, 
Honey, you have got to stop because your man picker, it is done broke. (laughs) And she would have been right. And that's what I did. But while I didn't have an eye for choosing men, I did have an eye for mentors. All through Ashton's life, I had watched, approved of, and chosen his athletic coaches. In high school, we met John Nosler and Tate Metcalf. Now, I could see that Tate and Ashton had a really special bond. I watched that relationship grow. I knew that Tate believed in Ashton and saw in him all the same potential that I saw. I trusted Tate. Finally, Ashton had more than a coach. He had a mentor. So I was in high school when the dating game was coming to an end. (laughs) And I watched my mom struggle through it, but there was really nothing I could do as a high schooler. Plus, she had already told me what I could do to make her happy. Find what I love and give it my best. Well, I love sports, especially track and field. And I was getting good, good enough to get letters in the mail from small colleges. Now, this was a big deal. Ever since I was a little kid, my mom would always tell me the importance of graduating college. So by this time, It was just like being a ninja turtle or a fighter pilot, something that I wanted to do. So I come out of the track locker room my senior year one day, and my coaches are sitting there waiting for me, Tate and Nas. Tate goes, Ashton! And if you know Tate, that's classic him. And I'm like, what's up, fellas? And they say, we know that college is important to you, and we think that you can get a scholarship to a Division I university if you tell them that you want to be a decathlete. So what do you think about the decathlon? I'm like, Division I scholarship? Sure. But what was that last word you said? (laughs) See, I had no idea what the decathlon was, just like I had no idea what a cartoonist was. But like my mom had shown me in so many of my other pursuits, I realized that they were showing me the door. So I continued my senior year, and at the end, I got a letter in the mail from the University of Oregon. They wanted to give me a scholarship to be a decathlete. And I went to college, and I realized that it was the tipping point of all of my my mom's efforts and my ambitions. I had found what I loved, and I was giving it everything, the decathlon. It was the embodiment of everything that gave me joy when I was a kid. But more importantly, I graduated college, just like I dreamt of doing. (laughs) Woo! (laughs) Right? (laughs) See? No one in our lineage had ever graduated from college. I couldn't focus enough to stay in college, and, well, there were no expectations from me, and I met those. (laughs) I did. So when Ashton walked across that stage in his cap and gown to collect his diploma, it was powerful, as if the universe had seen our struggle, all the hard work that both Ashton and I had done and finally was saying, yes. I knew that day Ashton's life would be different than mine. I knew that he now had a foundation whereby he could pursue even more of his potential, a life that he would be powerful in knowing who he was and be comfortable in his own skin. How do you raise an Olympian? You have to foster all of their potential, no matter what they want to be. What was my potential? Let me show you these. These are my report cards from kindergarten through fourth grade. Rosalind is very creative and a great storyteller. Rosalind loves art. Rosalind is a sparkle in our classroom, and you should be proud of her. This was my potential. The problem was, the first time these envelopes were ever opened was six months ago by me. Nobody had ever opened these envelopes. Nobody had ever seen my childlike potential or supported my dreams. I was invisible. My potential was literally locked in a box. So if you ask me, how do you raise an Olympian? The answer is, honestly, 
You don't. You can see there is no secret sauce. There's no special formula. I never set out to raise an Olympian. Far be it from that. I wanted Ashton's childhood to not be like mine. I wanted to give him experiences and knowledge of who he was to draw from so that he could make informed choices and decisions about his life and how he wanted to spend it. I wanted him to pursue these things without fear and find his greatness. The thing is, any dream I've had, I've always thought it tangible. Ninja Turtle, fighter pilot, <laughs> Olympian. These things were real to me, and it was really never a question of if, it was always just which one. Now, I knew that we struggled, and I knew that we went without. I didn't know everything. But when my mom would tell me, it's all right, Ash, everything's going to be all right, I knew that more than just telling me, she was also trying to convince herself. But that made things more powerful to me, because I could see how strong she was being. Winning the, world, winning the world record and winning the gold medal, that was my ultimate thank you to my mom. I wanted to accomplish something to prove her right, to show her that she was good at something. She was great at something. She was a great parent, an Olympic mom who let me experience my interests, never thought anything I liked was foolish, who didn't keep my potential locked in a box. The only difference between you and me or any child is in the dreams we have not our ability to pursue them. My mom taught me that I could pursue anything, just find what I love and give it everything. If there's one thing to take away from today, it's that my life is a manifestation of that idea. Thanks, Mom. <laughs>